Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. Lawrence Haas is my next guest, and he's becoming a good friend of mine, a better friend of mine every time we have a conversation. I just can't believe how fast the time flies by when Lawrence and I get on the phone. He's a philosopher, he's a teacher, he's a thinker and a writer, he's a practitioner, a craftsman, an artist, he's a magician, and we talk a lot about magic. He's written a book recently called Inspirations, Performing Magic with Excellence. Look it up. And what's so interesting about what Lawrence thinks and talks about is it's very much related these days to the art of magic, the craft of magic, performing and thinking and creating. But it's also about how that applies on a variety of levels. We talk about the idea of tools and not rules. We talk about something connected to the idea of a total experience and what it means to be an architect of space. And you're going to find out why we... We talked a lot about wallpaper peeling off of a wall. How ridiculous is that? But you'll see how it connects to pretty much everything. And what I love about conversations with Lawrence is they always seem to come full circle and are deeply connected to things that matter. Um, Lawrence is coming up in a few seconds here. DavidPeckLive.com for more information about my speaking and my books and a whole lot of other podcasts there as well, including part one with Lawrence. Stay tuned. Uh, DavidPeckLive.com for more information. And coming up, and soon to a theater near you, Lawrence Haas. Well, welcome to Face to Face. And we, uh, real treat today, we're joined uh, by a very special guest who has been on the show before, uh, Lawrence Haas, Professor Lawrence Haas, Dr. Lawrence Haas, um, who is also the Associate Dean of the McBride Magic and Mystery School in Las Vegas. Thanks for joining us, Lawrence. Well, thank you for having me back, David. We had such a great time the first conversation we had i'm really looking forward to it we really did it was uh and and i've had i just want you to know and i'm sure you've heard uh some of the feedback as well but it's been absolutely delightful the feedback i've received from both uh, magicians and and non-magicians the muggles of the world also apparently enjoyed your um uh, our interview as well so that's that's always a good sign I'm so pleased. Yeah. So, you know, I wanted to say, I, I, I've read a fair bit of your work over the, uh, over the years, your philosophy, but also your, your, your philosophy of magic, I suppose you could say. But your book, uh, your most recent book, Inspirations, uh, Performing Magic with Excellence is the subtitle. Um, I got to tell you, uh, I absolutely love the book. Thank you. I'm so pleased. Yeah. It, so, so for those of you out there who don't know, there's a magician by the name of Tommy Wonder. And he uh, changed the way I think magic has been done to some degree, but more importantly, probably changed the way people thought about magic. I have a feeling that people are going to look back at your book in a similar light uh, year from uh, maybe maybe not in year many many years, but even in a few years. Uh, I I had a, I had this visceral experience with your book, very similar to reading those books quite a few years back. So yeah, so well done. Thank you. Thank you for the contribution. Well, that's. Lofty Company, Tommy Wonder was a master magician who I admired greatly, and, um, and uh, yet he was one of my own inspirations for writing this book, because oh, okay. he, um, his, his books, uh, which were called The Books of Wonder in two volumes, um, really set on a path of trying to educate magicians about how to be better magicians. Right. And they played that function for me. And um, I have, in my own writings for magicians, I have a very similar sensibility. Um, over the years, I've made just about every mistake as a performer. <laughs> right. And, um, and, uh, but I learn from every mistake. Sure. I learn from every single show. And not only do I learn, but I take notes. As a scholar, I keep track. And, and these uh, experiences have brought about the essays in that book, Inspirations, uh, which touch on a whole range of things for magicians to consider 
uh, as they try to be more effective performers of magic. Okay, so I have a question for you that just I'm, I'm looking down at my page of notes and I started to write a sentence and the first word was rules and I didn't finish it. So I'm going to go intuitively. Do you, do you work within a p confined set of rules or do you break those rules more often than not? That of course, assuming that you use them in the first place. Yeah, well, it's a great question. Uh, uh, so uh, the way I think about um, the things I write about, the ideas that I write about, is that they are tools mm. and not rules. Right. And when you make that adjustment from hearing a philosopher, especially, um, talking about ideas and making suggestions, when you change them from being rules and laws to being tools for you to consider, everything shifts. You know, everything changes. Uh, oh, that's not, he's, not, he's not being a dogmatic, you know, pedantic teacher. What he's being is a craftsman. Right. who's learned from years of experience, and he's sharing tools that I can consider to see if they'll help me with my work. Tools are much less aggressive and are much less mm. um, you know, judgmental uh, than rules. And I think this is true in general with life, uh, right. you know, that good ideas are best viewed as tools, not rules, but it's doubly true when it comes to art. Because artists, um, just over time and overall, uh, tend to break rules. And uh, um, rules are, I don't think rules are very productive, but ha rules are exceptionally productive. Have, have, having been, so let's, let's talk about discovery for a second, true discovery mm -hmm. and discovering what works in one setting and doesn't in another as a, as a magician. But let's go back, harken back to your days as a philosopher as well. I mean, not that you can ever, you know, separate yourself from that, I suppose, going forward, but trained in philosophy, I mean it's kind of a way of thinking it's there is a certain even though i suppose for me the the most interesting philosophers are the ones who are breaking the rules all the time you know mm -hmm. i guess the existentialists would be would be a good group of those to look at the ones who who have annoyed a lot of the traditional philosophers over the years because they don't follow the typical rules um they're not trained necessarily in the history of philosophy and so on and so on so would you s say the greatest work is done outside of those frameworks well, um, I think what I would say is something a little bit different, that the history of philosophy itself is an ongoing conversation about uh, breaking rules. Mm. You know, the kind mm -hmm. of great mm. fur father of Western philosophy, at least, um, is Socrates. Mm -hmm. And uh, Socrates was put to death for his trouble. Mm, it's true. Uh, mm. Which is to say that he was a rule breaker. He... Um, he questioned the norms, the rules of Athenian society, and he launched, you know, what we what we consider Western philosophy because of that. Now, what happens in philosophy is the next person it tends to be a rule maker, and that tends to be, you know, in this particular rendering of the story, it tends to be Plato. Uh, you can find lots of, of rules in Plato for the good life and the well-ordered soul and, right. you know, um, and the well-ordered city. Um, but then along comes Aristotle, and Aristotle is a rule breaker. And you can go through the history of Western philosophy from one particular perspective and see that it's a conversation between rule makers and rule breakers. <laughs> That's great. So I would say um, I am definitely belong to the counter history of philosophy, right. which is all, that whole lineage of thinkers who is deeply suspicious of rules, but is very pragmatically oriented with their ideas, so they're creating tools for life or right. for practice. So Aristotle, Hume, William James, Martin Heidegger, Ludwig Wittgenstein, the existentialists, these are all um, part of, I would say, this counter history of, uh, of, of using philosophy uh, to create tools for living. 
rather than rule for life. Well, and what's interesting about the whole tools thing is, I mean, here you are using the metaphor and so on, but, you know, you've got tools in your toolbox that are, are designed to do a certain thing, but every now and then, because you're indwelling the use of them, whether it's a pack of cards or a carpet knife or a Phillips screwdriver, it's moments where you're in the middle of it, um, tacitly, that discoveries are made. Yep. This happened just this morning, in fact. Hmm. I'm working on a new piece of magic, and I've read about, you know, this idea in a book, and, you know, it was just an idea in a book. And over the weekend, I created the physical prop for it, which required I go to the art shop and buy tools and buy a certain kind of cardboard. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, then I put this all together and discovered that it wasn't going to work like it was written in the book. Right. And so right. the last few days have been a process of, rebuilding the prop, hmm. creating new tools, and in the process, discovering a whole new effect that wasn't even in the book. Mm. And good. I believe that's part of the work of being a, a performing artist and, and, and just an artist, which is that, um, you know, the ideas or the rules yep. um, only get you so far. At some point, you've just got to put the books down and get to work as a performer or a practitioner as an artist. I feel uh, I feel an essay coming on here, uh, Lawrence, uh, rebuild, <laughs> uh, called Rebuilding the Prop. That could be the mm -hmm. title of the chapter of uh, one of your next books. Hey, just, just a little anecdotal. When you mentioned Heidegger, um, I remember the day, I remember the place where I bought Being in Time, a copy of, you know, pr probably Heidegger's most important work. Yes. I remember that I can feel I can feel the paper, I can smell <laughs> the book, and just so you know, I'm pretty sure I'm having I'm going to have the same experience with your book, Inspirations. Uh, I, I'm I'm putting you in the same category. How's wow. that? Wow. <laughs> well, you know, thank you. I had that experience with Heidegger too. Yeah, I, mean, I bet. Being in Time was a kind of world changing book because it it uh, turned uh, previous philosophy kind of upside down and open up the world in a new way. And, you know, that would be a beautiful thing if that were true with my book. Well, I hope it is, and I think it will be for, for many. I, I remember reading the first few pages of Being in Time going, what the hell is he talking about? But <laughs> wow, something is important. Something important is going on here. There was this, and I think that's kind of case in point, there was something in, uh, phenomenologically, intuitively that was going on uh, as I was unpacking this, and and yet on that rule kind of toolbox level, I didn't know what the heck was going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. Well, I, you know, I I think readers will find that my book is is not so um, um, linguistically obscure. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Yes. So let's let's kind of tie it in. So I'm going to quote someone who's quoting somebody. So you quote Jeff McBride, who's quoting a famous Asian thinker. Quote, start the fire in the east, attack in the west, mm. close quote. Talk about that as a performer and maybe as a teacher as well. And and I'd love for you to kind of, you know, obviously apply it to the magician and, and, and to the, the performer who's working an audience and working a crowd. But what about me as the father, you yeah. know? What about me as the teacher? What about me as the principal or the bus driver? Um Anyway, I, I, I think that's part of the reason why I loved your book so much is that, that, that I think anyone could read the book and, and, and sort of maybe speed read through the, the, the effects and the, and the technical stuff and actually draw so much from it on, on a whole other level. Uh, well, I'm so glad. I mean, well, first let me start with, with the discussion of that idea in, uh, in magic. So the quote is from Sun Tzu, uh, The Art of War, and at, at that conversation Jeff McBride and I were having was helping me figure out a solution for making uh, the surprise production of a prop more magical. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in the effort to make a surprise appearance of something happen, it's pretty good advice. It was excellent advice um, to be reminded that we need to attack in the east and or set the fire in the east and attack in the west. And, you know, what this meant concretely is draw the audience's attention over here while you prepare uh, for the magical uh, appearance over here. And uh, as, as a magician, this is extraordinary advice in general. 
because when you're working for live people, not cameras, cameras can't be misdirected, but right. when you're working for live people in a live theater, um, organizing and directing the attention of everybody who's there becomes a preeminent concern. Mm. Um, because if they are not uh, looking where you want them to look, there will be very little magic at the magic show. Right. So, now, is that operation of uh, directing their attention done so I can, like, fool the pants off them and deceive them and take advantage of them? Not really. It's being done so I can delight them with a moment of magic. You know, people come to the magic show wanting, uh, hoping that perhaps the magician tonight will be good enough, talented enough, that they can give the gift of wonder. Mm. And so when I am, uh, I'm not exactly attacking in the West. I am, uh, instead of attacking in the West, I'm trying to delight people from the West. Right, right. <laughs> Start a fire in the East and delight them. Delight them in the West, <laughs> yes. Little little paraphrase there. Yeah, I'm okay with that. You know, I, I, I was at a talk last night, uh, uh, um, uh, a Tibetan monk, uh, Tibetan scholar, I guess, but who studied, actually studied with a couple of uh, Dalai Lama's mentors. I mean, a, a guy who's lived in, in Tibet for 12 years, written about 25, but I mean, this guy's been living the life for years. And, and I was trying to sort of crystallize it to some degree, not to reduce it on the drive home, but just to, to sort of reflect. And one of the things I took away, and I think this is what I took from your book as well, and I think from probably from your performances, uh, Lawrence, is... Um, this idea of the creation of a of a space, um, of a safe space, of a as in your words, a delightful space, that uh, is is memorable, um, is going to resonate on some level. I mean, it's the kind of magic I've always wanted to create. I think I think one of the things that's frustrated the heck out of me as a magician is, I do this beautiful coin vanish. I mean, I you know think it's beautiful, and you get the aha, and you get the moment, and then immediately. You know, people have been reduced to an equation. Oh, well, where did it go? Is it up your sleeve? Did, did you palm it? Is it in your pocket? Did it fall on the floor? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I've always been really um, challenged, I guess, by, by trying to get people beyond that, you know, that, 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 that rational moment, if you will. Yes. Well, you know, one of the things I think I can say that will dovetail into this is that in my view, creating a moment or an experience of magic is a total um, experience. That is, hmm. if I just go up to someone and do a m mystery with a pack of cards or with coins, I'm unlikely to be very successful mm -hmm. because the conditions are unlikely to have been right for them. Right. Um, I'm engaged in creating a total theatrical experience when I'm doing a coin routine, and it becomes more magical and more astonishing and more powerful when I have made choices and decisions and carried out um, activities that make make this space possible for the person to have it, the magic. So I'll give you an example. Just two weeks ago, I was uh, doing a performance. I was doing it at a restaurant very nice restaurant, and I came in about an hour and a half before the show, which is usual for me, and they said, here's the room, and they were so proud and happy about the room, and they had put the chairs in such a situation that I was going to be performing against a bare wall that had, um, I don't know, kind of parts of the wallpaper were missing and so forth. Mm. And this is this what I'm about to describe happens frequently as a performer. So I said, "Wow, this is fantastic space!" But you know what? It would be much better if we turned all the chairs around so mm. they were facing the fireplace. <laughs> the fireplace was a much better picture sure. for me to be performing in sure. front of. And what I was doing in this perhaps bothersome shift was. I'm thinking about the total theatrical experience because the audience would sit there watching me against a bare wall with, you know, wallpaper peeling, <laughs> and they would be feeling a certain kind of thing that wasn't to my best advantage. 
Whereas if I'm performing in fire in front of a fireplace that has a nice little uh, gentle fire uh, cooking in it, I've created a very different experience. Mm. So, so um, one of my inspirations in this regard is the great and legendary magician Di Vernon, who very famously said, "Be a good general." Mm. When you're performing magic, be a good general. And the idea is, you know, create the high ground. Right. Create the right space so that when you perform, the, the audience members, even if it's just one person, has the best chance of having that astonishing experience. I love the I love the details too of your story about the fireplace versus the peeling wallpaper, and you know for me years ago, and I don't think you and I talked about this in our interview, and I don't think I've talked about this in maybe any other podcast interview that I've done, but uh, I remember it um, uh, might have been a theater director, I think it was a magician, who said people will notice when things aren't done in a particular way. Yeah. So, for instance, if your let's say your pants are creased or the handkerchiefs that you use in your act, or your hat is creased. But if it's, uh, they're going to notice that when, it, when, it, when it's creased. But if it's not creased, they're not going to say, wow, isn't it wonderful he, he, he ironed all of his handkerchiefs before coming out on stage tonight. A- and those details, the one, I mean, isn't that, isn't that in, an interesting observation in, in, in a way fr- with respect to pretty much everything? And I think it has to do with the, you know, no one probably went home, would have gone home saying, oh, geez, I wish, I wish that magician hadn't worked against the backdrop of peeling wallpaper. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the but fact that you... they would have felt the difference. They would have felt the difference if they, that they had the opportunity. What I love is your care and the intimacy behind the decision that you made and you pushed for that because of your, you know, your desire to not only create a great moment in a space, but because of your um, hmm, attention to detail. You'll love this part of the story as well. They'd had the chairs... Did it end up in a barroom brawl, Lawrence? <laughs> no, no, it was fantastic. Oh, oh good. The, the, the chairs... <laughs> The chairs were in an absolutely straight line. Yeah, oh, right. So when we turned the chairs, I put a gentle curve in. So now they were also able to see each other and see me in the middle of them, mm. in the middle of each other. Right. So we just turned it from my, it being Larry standing in front of rows of seats to Larry being in the middle of a community. And just it's that good. transformation made yeah. that happen. No, it's great. It, it was essential for the for the for the uh, really the feeling and the experience that we had. So uh, it does require attention to detail. I try to be an architect of space and mm. an organizer of nice. time because it's my job. Right. To make it as possible as as humanly possible as I can to create the place where the audience can come into my play world. Am, am I allowed to invoke the uh, philosophy card again? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so 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 um in in uh in the book Inspirations, you've you've got a chapter called What's the Story About Story Magic? I mean, mm-hmm. creating a space um getting people into a circle, the fireplace. I mean, what, I mean, that's all part of the story, it seems to me. And you talk yeah. about Aristotle and, and uh, about this, quote, combination of incidents or actions, close quote. And uh, a little further in the chapter, you say, um, and this is you now, <coughs> quote, let's not leave stories to the storytellers. There is no intrinsic need to do that. But it also means something equally pointed for any of us who might want to weave stories around our plots that we must work really hard and probably harder than we think to ensure our storytelling magic is not weak or boring. That is, it is imperative that we learn to tell magic stories in right and effective ways, close quote. I I love that for a whole lot of reasons. Um, But the part about, just the other day I read somewhere, somebody said that the, the, the shortest distance between a human being and the truth is a story. And, and and you're talking about it in the context of a magic performance, but I think it, it's just so applicable across the board. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, that's, that's a wonderful saying. Um, one thing that we know is that the human animal is a storytelling animal. Mm. When we come together at the end of our days with our loved ones, our family, 
our spouses or partners, we tell them about our day and we're telling stories. And we listen to their stories. Uh, when you think about it and examine it analytically, many of our conversations are narratives. Right. And um, even this one is a narrative. Yeah, sure. We can't help ourselves um, from telling narratives as we live our lives. So I think storytelling and story itself is very deep in our spirit. And so magicians who, and, and not just magicians, but theater artists and singers and performers and even fine artists, when we understand that we are performing a fundamental uh, function, um, everything gets better. Right. So instead of my just being, here, look at my trick, fooled you. Right. You know, when, when we understand what we're doing is weaving a spell, mm. um, we are doing something that people hunger for. Um, you know, once upon a time, are the most magical words in the world. Forget about abracadabra. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. A long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yep. That is welcoming us to sit at the fire. And, That's uh, good. And, and open on to this imaginative world. So I think very consciously about this, not just in terms of like a particular magical story I will perform, right. which I do from time to time, but just in terms of what I'm doing is creating a kind of symbolic place for, so I can weave my spell around the fire. Now, I don't tell that to my audience. Right, right. <laughs> but, but they live it and they feel it because this is primordial stuff. So, you know, at, at the end of our day when we reconnect with our people and share our stories, that's primordial stuff. And, uh, and you know, the magician just has a a wonderful extra talent because he or she brings special effects to the party. <laughs> right, right. Is is this is this a part of that um delight that you were talking about before that 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 you know I hate you know what I do not appreciate the word happiness in this context. But right. I'm not even sure I like the word happiness at all actually. But uh, contentment, joy, I'm okay with those. Um but I love delight, and, and, and I think it's deeply and intimately connected to pleasure. When you, when you said, in a long time ago, in a galaxy, I mean, I, got, I actually got a bit of a shiver just because of all that I bring to that, yeah. t t because of how young I was at the time, how I'm now sharing it with my kids, how we just recently watched the movie, et cetera. And it's, and it, and it's all, and I think there's something about that bringing people to the fireplace again there yeah lawrence you know I, getting them I, in the getting them in the circle getting them the hell away from the peeling wallpaper yeah. <laughs> you know yeah anyway i no, i i think i think that's right when i i use the word primordial mm -hmm. kind of literally yes there is something very deep and very human about gathering together um to move into imaginative play space nice and yeah. um I, I'm not sure it happens in front of a flat screen. <laughs> okay. Yep. You know, I, 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 you know, I respect what flat screens can present to us, the spectacles that flat screens can present to us. But I'm quite convinced at this point in my life that it's fundamentally different from when people are feeling the fire, sharing mm -hmm. the air, mm -hmm. in physical contact with one another. And uh, I am a guardian of that world. Um, my interest in being on a flat screen is not terribly high. My interest in moving into communities and bringing people together to weave a particular magical spell of wonder and delight is very high. And is that uh, for you um, how you would, would you, would you define pleasure is that is that a is that a pleasurable moment at oh, that point yeah well yes Let, this is such a wonderful thing to explore because i've thought quite a lot about and i think that's why i like the word delight over happiness by the way yeah me too delight is a really good word for it because it is experienced like the light bulb going on right it's like oh boom it's like a burst it's like whoa, right right fantastic you know um 
I've been thinking a lot over all these years about the specific pleasure that's going on in magic. Now, to understand, I think, what this special delight is, it's important to kind of harken back to the whole kind of philosophical and religious tradition, at least in the Western world, Mm. and to some extent in some traditions in the Eastern world as well, which is that pleasure is bad. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, both in Plato and classical Buddhism, pleasure is craving. Right. It's craving one thing after another. And when you get that craving fulfilled, you're craving again for something else. That's the model of pleasure that's running through the argument in Plato's Republic. And, you know, it's the first noble truth in Buddhism. Right. Um, that we are craving and craven being. And so... You know, the goal is to ennoble ourselves through, at least with Plato, with reason. Now, I understand the structure of that argument, but already Aristotle pointed out that pleasure is so much more than cravenness, that there are many different kinds of pleasure. And Aristotle, you know, friend to artists everywhere, says one of the great pleasures in life is the kind of learning we get through art. Mm and narratives and theater. Now, you know, I'm definitely an Aristotelian in this sense. I think the, I think one of the deep pleasures we get uh, through a magical experience is not so much learning, but it's more a kind of being lifted out of our mundane life mm-hmm. into this place where the impossible is possible. In my experience as a performer, when you overcome people's cynicism or exhaustion, Mm -hmm. and you remind them that the impossible is possible, even even just in a theatrical way, that's when the light bulb goes on. Yeah. Um, Well, and aren't aren't we now back to creating a space? I mean, isn't this really, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, the... the, um, Glenn Mullen, the the the, the Lama that I was uh, chatting with just just yesterday, who ha- had given this talk, talked a great deal about this idea of play and um, humor within the context mm-hmm. of Tibetan Buddhism. In you mm-hmm. know maybe maybe not Theravada B- Buddhism, but I mean I know they're connected. But but f- he specifically focused on this idea that uh, the Dalai Lama uh, is one of the most mis- mischievous people he knows. In yeah. fact, direct direct quote from the Dalai Lama, actually, <laughs> yeah. that that this idea of, of play and of fun and and in a sense, I mean, that's uh, we, when we think of yeah, when we think of pleasure, I think we typically sort of uh, demonize it to some degree. Absolutely, this is a very long and quite frankly boring tradition. Um, you know, church fathers from the very very beginning have demonized pleasure. Um, and, of course, they're worried about sexuality, and they're of worried course. about rampant sexuality, and they're worried about childhood sexuality. And, um, you know, th- and that's probably Plato's model of craving as well. But um, Yeah, you've got, the, you've got this idea, Lawrence, of the suffering, uh, the suffering mystic and not, not the joyful one or the delighted right. one, right? Yeah, exactly. In, or, in order to be religious or in order to be spiritual, you've got to walk up the steps on your knees. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, and that's right. And, and in my world, so for me, I would draw, I would, I would have us all uh, think about an important distinction between the kind of craving pleasure that is chaotic, which is uh, dissolution, uh, which is a lack of control, and you can't help yourself on one hand, which that's a very real kind of pleasure. Uh, people do get in those positions. Yep, yep. And addictive life is all about those very painful and destructive uh, cravings. On the other hand, there's what I would call um, ecstatic experiences. Mm, mm-hmm. Now, the word ecstasy as itself has gotten polluted as well. Um, you know, it gets dragged down into that other side. But I would invite us to use the old Greek sense. Um, That's the root of ecstasy, which is ecstasis. Mm. And the word, the Greek word ecstasis means um, lifted out of yourself. Mm. Taken outside of your 
everyday life. And that ecstasis, that particular kind of stepping outside of our mundane thinking and living, I believe is absolutely essential for us. We, all of us, move in habits. It's part of the human condition. And we need to be reminded to step outside of our everyday habits and mundane thinking. And, uh, you know, so when I think of ecstatic experiences, uh, you and I can make a list together, David, I'm sure, but that's what vacation is all about. Mm -hmm. That's what going to the mountains is all about. Sure. Um, it's what bucket list items are all about. Stepping outside of our everyday thinking and our everyday life and being opened up, awakened to the extraordinary wonder of the world around us. And that just does feel good. And not, and not to go too corny, but to pull it sort of back to what we were talking about earlier, you've, you've left the toolbox at home. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. Right. This is this is about stepping outside of that framework, that structure, that ideological, those ideological inklings that we all take with us when we walk out the door, whether we want to or not. Yeah, we've left the rule box behind. The rule box the rules behind. Rules are: yeah. get up at six o'clock every morning and yeah. have my breakfast, yeah. and I have one and a half cups of coffee. I mean, you know, humans do that because it's convenient and and comfortable and all of that, but. Um, but uh, leaving the rule box and the toolbox behind to just, whoa, have the light bulb go on, we need that. We need that to be whole human beings. And we need to go back from these ecstatic experiences uh, to the fires of our own dinner table and share those with our loved ones and our friends. In, in, in Inspirations, you talk about, uh, about compelling dramatic curves. You talk about bending bending an audience's expectations yeah. and, and about subverting assumptions. And I think it ties in really nicely to this idea of taking a holiday from all of that BS. And, and, and then you quote one of my, one of my favorite filmmakers and thanks for doing it. Canadian filmmaker, David Cronenberg, you quote an, a quote, an entertainer gives you exactly what you want. An entertainer gives you those good old songs that you want to hear. An artist gives you what you don't know you want, which I think is delightful. Um, and, and then he goes on to say something you might know you want the next time, but you never knew you wanted before. Close yeah. quote. That's, I don't know where you found that, but that's marvelous. But I love this idea too, your, your idea of bending an audience's expectations, subverting those assumptions. And I think it's going to tie in quite nicely what I want to try to wrap up our conversation about. And I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of secrets mm -hmm. as well. But, but, but talk to me about that entertainer versus the art. I mean, most of the magicians I know, I think, are entertainers, I think, mm -hmm. at the risk of sounding arrogant and condescending and hypercritical. I, yeah, I think what's happened with, well, there's this we could talk all hours about. <laughs> That's but, right. Um, you know, I think sometimes um, some magicians get in the, in the world where they think, oh, I'm not an artist. Right, right. I'm just an entertainer. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah, you can give people exactly what they expect. Sure. Absolutely, that's one way to go. But the truth of the matter is we're engaged in acts of theater as magicians. There's no way to avoid it. You know, as soon as you're performing, you are in the realm of art and art making, whether you own mm -hmm. up to it or not. And mm -hmm. so um, as soon as you're in the realm of performing, artistry is a possibility. And I love uh, David Cronenberg's quote, which I read in The Rolling Stone, Nice. When that magazine was published, and I kept that interview for exactly to keep that quote. Um, we, my job as an artist is not to just play the great old hits. Right. I do some of that, but it's also sometimes to give them something they don't yet know they want. That's my job, is to bend their expectations, to give them something new and fresh, something that we might say ecstatic, something that lifts them out of their expectations and assumptions about what was going to happen here tonight. Yeah. It might be that I tell them a, a powerful story. Right, yep. Or it might be that I do something so surprising, like uh, reveal some particular thing that happened without there being a magical effect at all, as long as it's part of a theatrical curve. Mm -hmm. So, you know,
know, audiences bring expectations. Create, like, create, you know, a, create, a, create a sense of community that they were coming to a cocktail party of, of all the places that they didn't want to go. And then you go and create a sense of community that's actually warm. You, 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 you've turned them towards the fireplace in a sense. Yeah. That is, you know, part of, part of the work. Not easy and to do either, right? Right. Not easy to do when holding a pack of cards and, 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 and people have this expectation about what a magician's supposed to Hey, come on, you got to fool me, you know, while I eat my overcooked salmon. I, one, one of the things that has always mo- moved me and motivated me as a magical artist is to overcome the entrenched assumptions about what this is, both on the part of magicians, but mm-hmm. also on the mm-hmm. part of audiences whose ideas of magic are, are really quite impoverished for the most part. Right, right, yeah. Um, and my whole goal is to elevate everybody, you know, to elevate uh, audiences to see that magic it, it can be a great art and to educate magicians, uh, you know, don't set your sights so low. <laughs> right. You're already halfway home to something yeah. marvelous. Um, and I think people just are afraid. You know, I think I think that you know I think it's easy to want to stick with the comfortable. Right. Expectations help us contain surprises, um, and um, and you know, one of the things I say is building the community is a way for me to carry people to ecstasis, to ecstasy, um, in a safe way. Right. The theatrical space is the campfire space in which it is safe to go with the artist uh, for a, a surprising ride. And, and Lawrence, in a sense, the secret has nothing to do with that. No. No, I mean... Which, which, kind, of is, is, which is kind of a subversion of where it seems like most of our cultures add, right? This idea, oh, I have... It's a, you know, magic's a puzzle. I've got to get... To, you know, how do you do that, right? Is that that's sort of that knee-jerk reaction or that knee-jerk question that's asked when you do actually take somebody to a space like that. It seems to be what people um, um, sort of acquiesce towards. Yeah. It, it, is a, it, 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 it is interesting to me. What we're talking about in the issue of weaving a spell and creating a, 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 an audience and creating a theater, these are the real secrets. Mm, nice. Because if yeah. people think you can take out a deck of cards and fan them in an exciting way and have people feel transformed by it, they're fooling themselves. <laughs> Which is so funny. Yes. It's, it's, yeah. very, it's a very interesting paradox. So, yeah. uh, you know, I have a friend who says, oh, the magic of magic is everything besides the technical secret. Right. And there is a truth in that. Well, this whole idea of getting beyond the secrets. Right. I think I, I think I mentioned to you offline. I have a friend who who loves to watch magic on TV, but the only reason he'll watch it on TV is so he can rewind it, PVR, <laughs> PVR it, rewind it, and figure out how it's done. Right. And to me, there's a <laughs> that kind of breaks my heart in a certain way. Yeah. What I would say about that, David, is that he is pursuing a different kind of pleasure. Right. Which right. Is the, the pl- an intellectual pleasure of solving. The puzzle. Fair, fair enough. Yeah, but, but, um, and and that's a fine pleasure to have and pursue. But you know, um, the kind of pleasure we're talking about, that I think is at the heart of magical theater, um, is ecstasy. You know, it, it's ecstasis. It's standing outside of our customary patterns and behaviors and feeling the delight of that. So part of me wishes for your friend. Um, to be able to turn off the TV and go to a really good magic show. It's, it's, good, it's good advice. Um, but I do understand the intellectual pleasures because, my God, you know, I've spent a lot of time in that world. At the same time, I would say I've also stepped out of that world into my, you know, my full-time career as a creator and performer and designer of magical experience. I, I, I think when we do part three, Lawrence, I think yeah. that's what we should talk about. I think <laughs> we should talk about that, 
the the madness of leaving that career behind to become a magician and and focus on that because i think not only uh, could it benefit a lot of magicians and performers and entertainers and so on out there performance artists but i think a lot of people could could learn a great deal from 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 that conversation as well because that's a that's pretty monumental well thank you i it is it, it, it's it's um a, quite a story and i, I will tell is. you honestly i have been um trying to understand it as it's unfolded. Mm. You know, when I'm in the middle of it, uh, following imperatives that I didn't fully understand, right? but nonetheless felt were important, I didn't necessarily have a handle on the transformations that were happening in my life. But, but, um, oh my gosh, my, uh, you know, I, I followed them and I listened and uh, here I am. I get the joys and pleasures of being a full-time magic artist and giving the gift of, you know, delight and astonishment to people who um, who come uh, out to see me. It's a marvelous place to be. Can I can I can I quote something uh, from your book just just as sure. we wrap up here? I, and I think again, just to really heap on the praise. <laughs> Thanks. Again, love the book, and and I, I honestly truly believe that there are. are so many uh, bits of wisdom here and insight for, for others outside of magic. And I think I remember many years ago a director saying to me, don't read just magic books, but read the performance arts and read other uh, books that are going, you're, you're going to learn a lot from, from other, from other craft, from other arts as well. And, uh, and I think that certainly applies to your book inspirations. It's going to seem a little out of context, I think, but it, but but it, but it's a nice way to wrap up what we've been talking about. Um, this is, this is, um, uh, Dr. Lawrence Haas from Inspirations Performing Magic with Excellence. Quote, what I can tell you is that the underlying desire isn't going to fall from the sky and it can't be purchased at the magic shop. The only way to get at it by thinking by thinking about it, by being creative and thoughtful about how lay people could get excited about the effect or your ability to perform it. And then by crafting a presentation and script so the audience ends up being hot rather than staying or saying cool. Gasps, oohs, and awes are fine, but fleeting. If we want people to remember our magic, to be touched by it, to bubble over with excitement, then we have to hit them in their desires, close quote. Mm. It's wonderful, uh, Lawrence, for a whole lot of reasons, to the magician for sure, but I think there's things that each and every one of us can take away from that, and, and, and certainly from today's conversation. Wow. I, I, I'm glad you really connected with that. I... Um, you know, it, 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 that quote you just read really does connect with this whole issue of bringing people together. It does. I, and completing the circle of their, of their life. I, 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 it, it really does. I, there's so many little connecting points. I'm going to reflect back on them now, now that we've had the conversation and I made some notes. But one of the, one of the, one of the most delightful moments for me is the from, from, from the cracked wallpaper to the fireplace. <laughs> um, that one's going to stick with me for a long time. Uh, Lawrence, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, Lawrence Haas, he's the Associate Dean of the McBride Magic and Mystery School in Las Vegas. He's and Professor of Humanities at Austin College. In, in, in 2010, he retired, as we just mentioned, from the classroom to pursue magic as a full-time career. Uh, Lawrence, uh, again, time has flown by. I'll look forward to part three. Well, thank you so much, David. It's great, and I look forward to that further conversation.